Hello everyone, this is Matthew Nelson and welcome to my new demonstration on how to build a correlation matrix for portfolio optimization in an in-asset portfolio. Uh, we're going to build a matrix that's completely extensible and self-adjusting uh, as it calculates its correlations. So let's get started. Uh, this morning I, be I began this uh, model with choosing some uh, very dynamic and diverse uh, funds. Uh, this is for educational purposes. I'm not making any uh, recommendations, but uh, this, these assets represent um, uh, a good array of uh, international choices and the full gamut of all nine Morningstar investment styles. So we can see that you have Chinese equities, uh, energy stocks, American financials, um, and two bond uh, funds that uh, are basically short duration uh, cash equivalent stand-in. So we're not going to be correlating those two. Uh, we'll be using those for uh, uh, other purposes uh, as we uh, actually optimize the portfolio in a separate video. This video, I just want to show you the offset function to make life easy when you build a correlation table. All right, so the first step, uh, after you select uh, your, your, your investments, uh, or you already have your investments, is to get the historical prices. Just go to finance.yahoo.com and uh, pull up the uh, historical prices from the quote screen. Uh, I chose the last weekly returns, uh, ending weekly price of each trading week going back to the beginning of 2011. Uh, for, so these are all the prices and we'll use these prices to calculate our returns in order to build up our statistics about uh, expected return, risk or standard deviation, and correlation, and eventually in another video aggregate those all together to get the expected return and risk of an in-asset portfolio. So here are our securities that we're investing in and the prices. And now we calculate the returns. So the best way of doing this is using the log normal function, which gives us the continuously compounded return of each iteration, which is weekly in this situation. Uh, this saves us from having to annualize or uh, make other adjustments as we would with an arithmetic return. Uh, and it, uh, you know, because it's using the continuous function, it's uh, very easy and extensible to use in terms of time. Uh, I chose the beginning of 2011 to have enough point estimates to have uh, a good accuracy for expected returns, uh, but I also didn't want to have too many to have uh, too much statistical noise. And for the same reason, I chose weekly returns instead of daily returns to just eliminate noise and get a little bit better quality data. So this range here, beginning with iShares China on the left, down these 93 weeks of uh, data, and across all 10 assets, I named as a range uh, return, so that we can reference this whole set of data uh, simply as return, a named range to make life easy. All right, let's build our correlation matrix. So, uh, correlation matrix obviously shows how one thing is correlated to another. Uh, by thing, I mean data set. So, statistically, if one data set is highly correlated to another, they're basically moving in the same direction at the same time. Uh, so, as to be expected, if you correlate one thing against itself, one data set against the same data set, it will come out to be one. It is uh, self-identified. So uh, one control you can look at when you build this is to make sure you have a diagonal set of ones when you have um, the matrix set up. So that, oh, excuse me, uh, a little preview window, but uh, that's a good sign that you're doing things right. Also, if you don't have any negative correlations or uh, really low correlations, uh, that's theoretically possible, but it's probably not going to happen to have something completely counter-cyclical that it will be, in fact, negative. All right, let's get started building our function. All right, so this is a nested function in two parts, and Excel has a correlation function, corel, and all it does is look at one array or a range, basically, uh, you know, any data set and correlate it against a data set of the same size. And that's important just as a quality control measure. Make sure that each column of 
uh, returns that you have uh, previously prepared is is symmetric so that each one of these is going to be 93 weeks of data there's not going to be uh, some with more some with less weeks uh, important to keep it symmetric viewers uh, just keep that in mind so uh, starting with the offset function the purpose of this is going to be to use the same function in every one of the cells below in that correlation matrix uh, and we can just use the little uh, black cross to drag them across horizontally and then down and we're finished so this makes life much easier than going back one by one and highlighting the ranges with your mouse cursor uh, which uh, is very frustrating and prone to mistakes so for the first array we want to take uh, one column all right we're going to look at the columns first and then we're going to look at the rows in the second array so for each one of these we're going to compare a column against a row, then a column against that row again, and then all the way across, and then a column against the next row, and so forth. So we're going to end up with a symmetric table, because there's two on each side. So on either side of the diagonal identity, it will be the same thing. So uh, that's how that happens. Now moving on to our function, let's look at that first uh, set of columns. So. Offset, the first thing is to have a reference cell or a reference range. And previously, I named the range of returns, including the header, as return here. So that is our reference. And when you do have a range instead of a cell, Excel will use the top left cell as its global point of reference. So that's the reason for that. And the next component, next variable to the function is rows. And now the first three variables here is just setting up uh, where uh, Excel is supposed to look at in, in, as its point of reference. So we have the global array return, top left corner, one row down to start with the numbers, and then columns we want to move across as we move across. So name each one of these uh, numerically and subtract one in order to convert the absolute to the relative. So for this first one, we don't want to move over to the right or the left. Uh, we just want it to be itself, so we want a value of zero. And uh, so we just lock down the row by using dollar sign one and subtract one. All right, so now the height, when we're working with ranges, we have to have these last two variables in the offset function. So height will be how many rows down uh, it should be working with, and that's going to be those 93 weeks. In order to tell it that it's supposed to be 93 cells high, or, or long, or however you want to look at it, is to use the count A function, which is going to count the numbers in any given set of cells we tell it to look at. And that set of cells that it should look at is, again, relative to the global uh, named range of return, beginning with the first uh, numerical value in the row below, and then uh, again, going across uh, or ch not, uh, choosing the column that's uh, the asset we are working with, uh, just the same as it was uh, above uh, in, the, in the higher level. So this number 1,000 is we want to count all the numerical values in a range, and we just choose an arbitrary number. Uh, 1,000 is a good number because it completely uh, covers any data we will have in 1,000 rows down, and it's not too large to um, uh, tie up computing resources. So uh, definitely don't want it to be too small and emit data, but uh, also you know be conservative with... Uh, uh, computer resources because these models can uh, get pretty cumbersome and slow your computer down to uh, a near halt. So 1000 is what we chose there. Uh, one, uh, the width of the range we want to look at is simply one column. So it's just one cell wide. And again, moving out to the uh, higher level uh, in the nest is one cell wide. So we're only looking at columns. And we are done with the uh, first array. The second array, rather than being these columns uh, going this way, we want to pull uh, rows going this way against those columns. Uh, so instead of using uh, the lock down on the, uh, the number component or the row, we want to lock down the column. So the same way, these are the same numerical identity, 
uh, but we want to move down this time. So let's lock down the A, the, the row, um, I'm sorry, the column component, and let the row float as we drag the uh, black cross down. Again, we want to convert from absolute to relative, so subtract 1. Uh, again, we, we need to be, have symmetry with our correlation, so this is going to be the same number from above, the 93 weeks. Uh, it needs to be one cell wide, because we only are interested in, in, uh, in columns. And that's it. That's all you have to do. So once you set up that first cell, all you have to do is drag it across, and, and then drag it down and do the whole table like that and uh, that's all you have to do viewers uh, so uh, very very convenient uh, let me uh, pull out of the uh, zoom here so you can see the whole table uh, let me close this uh, so it gets some a uh, little bit better size and uh, move down hopefully just uh, bear with me. Oh, there we go. There's the whole thing. All right, so here we have our correlation matrix, and it is completely extensible. Uh, it allows you to freely add uh, more weeks of data or change your rep time reference point from weeks to days or months or whatever the case may be. Delete assets, add assets, and not have to do this again. So it's it's very powerful. Um, I wish I had known about this uh, when I was first studying portfolio theory. Uh, I hope you benefit from it if you're studying finance or uh, you just have a portfolio to manage or if it's just your own personal IRA, you know. Um, everybody can do this. Everyone has Excel. And so I hope you found this uh, interesting and informative. Uh, thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This is Matthew Nelson signing off.